Last night, a woman jogger was found unconscious and partially clothed in Central Park. She was beaten and sexually assaulted. A woman jogging in Central Park. Central Park was holy. It was the crime of the century. Five youths were arrested at 96th Street, all between 14 and 15 years of age. They got him! You can only imagine the pressure to have this crime solved and solved quickly. First, we was all together. Then they started to put us in different rooms separately. What did you do? Who were you with? Who did you come with? The tone was very scary. I felt like they might take us to the back of the precinct and kill us. You're not going to go home until you give up a story. I told my son, go to the park that night. I feel guilty. I'm telling the guy, I don't know what you're talking about. They're getting a little angry. And they're like, you know, you did it, didn't you? He had been interrogated for over 24 hours. That amounts to pressure. These young men were guilty. It was almost unquestioned. The police controlled the story. They created the story. They seized on the fears of the people, wilding the bestial characterization of the black man. There's no DNA match whatsoever to any of these boys. I was going nuts. No blood on the kids. Nobody could identify them. But if they confessed, they confessed, and that was that. A lot of people didn't do their jobs. Reporters, police, prosecutors, defense lawyers. This was institutional protectionist. We falsely convicted them, and we walked away from our crime. This is the ultimate siren that says none of us is safe. understand America, you're going to understand race, where you have to confront a question of race. And certainly at the heart of the Central Park jogger case, the Central Park Five, is race. And it's present in why the Civil War happened. It's present uh, in jazz, obviously. It's present in the national parks. It's present in baseball. It's, it's everywhere you scratch the surface of American history. So it feels both um, excitingly, refreshingly, different, and a lot of that has to do with Sarah Burns, my daughter, and David McMahon, the filmmaker, her husband's uh, influence, but also things I've wanted to experiment with, and I think that, that at the same time that has that refreshing aspect, it also feels familiar, too, that I'm at home with the issues, and the outrage, and the emotion. Being around uh, New York State Department of Corrections, and they, uh, and by their experience of true murderers, rapists, and so forth, they all, they saw me as a glass of water. So wow. that's what that's what that's what kept me alive to, alive today. They, they saw me as water. They saw, wow, you really, you really a sweet kid. Wow, you just got caught up in, you just got caught up in the media, the media circuit. So you just got caught up in it, you know. So it's sort of a the old saying, you are innocent. Well, that's that's the, that's the cop show. You are innocent <laughs> to prove you guilty, but guilty otherwise it innocent. was guilty to prove innocent. Yes, so that's that's what I felt. And to, like I said, to the New York State Department of Corrections, found himself being around me for a great number of years, so they was able to see through me because of their own experience. Yeah. So that's what kept me alive. So, you know, after all that, and, and uh, secondly, being, you know, just being graced by Mateus, you know, uh, to to lead up to lead up to me getting out. It's always, always, always scary to bear yourself again. I mean, in 1989, 1990, we were we were um, put in front of the media and basically forced. This was forced upon us, and we were forced to accept it and live our lives based on it, and then go to prison for it. Um, 
many of us, like Corey, Corey had the opportunity to come home a free person. And that in and of itself isn't enough because he had spent the most time in prison, you know? I came home to parole. I had finished my whole parole term. And then I had to, then I found out that I had to register for the Megan's Law for the rest of my life. The shame is, you know you didn't do it. You can't prove that you didn't do it, with, with the exception of your word. And everyone else thinks you did. So you don't want to jeopardize your job. You don't want to jeopardize your livelihood. You don't want to jeopardize your life by coming out and saying, here I am, hi, here's the bullseye, <laughs> you know. Um, Once again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's very, very scary. And it was scary, I think, for all of us. I think to, um, to realize the genuineness and the sincerity of Sarah, who, who initially approached us and said, you know what, we need to get a book out about you guys. You know, then to finally have the movie made, it was like, wow, we got our voices back. You know, this, this film was done so masterfully that it shows us in the exact light of who we are. Not who we hope to be, but who we are. And it shows us that we're actually human beings. Um, that, that aspect of being an inmate in a city jail, as opposed to being an inmate in a state jail, is so different. So. I had the unfortunate opportunity of, when we got convicted, of going to Rikers Island. They were supposed to send me back to Spofford. When I went into the tombs, every single inmate that I saw basically was saying to us, we're going to get you. You know, going to prison first, especially for a crime of rape, the inmates have their own way of dealing with that. So to go from the city jail to the adult facility in the state is almost so, it's like a, it's not necessarily a complete contrast, but there were folks like when I got to Clinton Danamora, there were folks who looked at me and said, this guy's a political prisoner. And they told the other inmates, if anything happens to him, there's gonna be some serious consequences. And these were guys who, I didn't, I didn't know what our prison numbers meant until Someone pointed it out to me, and my prison number at that time was 95A1113. So my birthday, uh, when I turned 21, they gave me a slap on the back and said, welcome to prison, welcome to real, real prison, the adult facility, and sent me about my way. And what that meant was in 1995, the first part of the year, which was the A, 1113, I was the 1,113th person to enter the door. And it was only February 27th. You know, um, Corey had been experiencing jail, like real city jail. For six years. For six years. When I got to the adult facility, I thought the worst thing that I had experienced was the youth facility. People were getting beat up. In the adult facility, people were losing their lives. People were losing their lives on Rikers Island. You see, so he kind of like was going through all of that. And to see, to see a person and say to themselves, this guy is no criminal. What is he doing here? <laughs> you know? And that's kind of the same sentiment that a lot of us had. People were like, what are you guys doing in prison? The system. Well, it basically comes with how you conduct yourself around police. You know, telling your kid what's procedure, what to say, what not to say. Um, and, and we felt that's where it starts. You know, you, the parents, the parents is also your first role model, is the person you look up to. So that message should come from them. And as far as the stop and frisk, uh, you know, we're talking, you know, over 750,000 people who have been stopped and frisked, and all those are not criminals. So that's very, you know, that's very valuable to our communities. You know, just that statistic alone, that, you know, that these uh, procedures, as far as kids knowing what to do and what not to do is, is very valuable. Well, I think the documentary medium is part of the whole situation. It can be as wrong as the papers were wrong. 
But I think in this case, it's possible that we can do something that can counteract that. But I also think that what it is is a large megaphone, which calls on not just police and prosecutors to admit their mistakes, but the media. And, and they can do things. Um, they can talk about mission. They can investigate some of the inconsistencies of why Mateus Reyes' name was known two days before the Central Park jogger case happened on April 17th. Uh, why no one followed through? Uh, why did we blame five young boys uh, for something that someone else was doing and continuing to do because they couldn't get off the beam of the idea that they had a spectacular story, the wilding thing. Yeah. Just, it brought out the worst in people and it brought out the worst in the media. And so I don't want to differentiate who we are as media, but I do want to say that media still has an obligation here to, to not just admit its own mistakes, which in some cases, in a few publications, they have, but to actively reinvestigate, to actually ask the important questions, why were these five kids put in jail for upwards of 13 years? Why is it now nearly a decade since they filed their own suit against the city and it hasn't been resolved in any way? These are questions that a documentary can ask, but they can be amplified by a media that had complicity in the original crime and now could be complicit with the, the, the closure that everybody needs. I think it's about understanding how this happened, um, understanding how false confessions happen and that they happen, that this isn't an isolated case, that these same problems are seen in cities everywhere, ev I mean, throughout the country, that, that we have to understand the, the roots of how something like this can happen. And so it's not just about this case, but about how we can prevent this kind of thing from happening again. And this exact thing could happen again. This is not something that is you know, isolated to the 1980s or something. I mean, we still deal with these same problems. And so I think well, this is about education. It's about knowing your rights. It's about knowing um, how these tactics can lead to false confessions. I think all of that is really important. It's about educating ourselves. After you done been away for something you do it, come home, there's no there's nothing going on for you. You just dead. Ah. So yeah. coming across you know, just coming across uh, the blessings of the Byrne family to give us a voice. To to just flip everything what was done to us when we was when we was babies up to now as adults so and to get all this wonderful hype which is which I will call it we just coming out of Halloween so this would be like a Friday the 13th to the city <laughs> you know what I'm saying Jason lived we thought he was dead you know as far as the response you know with the in the interaction with the audience this has been great very emotional at times you know we did a, a Toronto and it was just, it was my first time sitting with a big audience and I was speechless for a couple of minutes. I couldn't speak um, because it just impacted me so greatly. Um, and as far as it storing our humanity, it, it does, you know, because it gives us a chance to finally lift that boulder off of our shoulders and, um, and, and kind of like therapeutic for us, you know, that we tell our stories and, and, and we let people see that we are human. In our cases, even though our you know, our records have been expunged. Um, people can still go to Google and type in Yusuf Salam or Corey Wise and all of a sudden the case will pop up. So that invisible uh, sign is still there. And being able to talk about it, being able to be received the way we've been received is so therapeutic and so so necessary. It's been it's been um, wow. It's it's really been nice. And that, that's a that's a that's a mild word, but it's been very very nice and very welcoming for us to feel normal, to feel like okay cool, people aren't uh, you know here and ready to pick up pitchforks and stakes and, and, and tie us to trees you know um, kind of uh, what I think that 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 uh, Donald Trump had hoped to happen you know back in 1989 and 1990. Um, with him pulling out those full-page ads in the New York City's media saying that he wanted the death penalty to be reinstated. You know, we constantly walk around 
in that reality and also realizing that had this been the earlier part of the century, we would have been pulled from our homes and hung from trees in Central Park. Well, we, uh, we were originally subpoenaed in September, um, and we, we responded to the city with our argument that we um, shouldn't have to turn these things over, that we were protected by the journalist's privilege, and they narrowed the subpoena down to some degree. Um, but at that point, they also accused us of not being independent journalists, and um, we feel that's an unfair characterization. And so we are continuing to object to, to the subpoena and, and the nature of the subpoena. And I've worked with Ken on and off for the last 15 years, and so um, I'm familiar with the very familiar with the language that he's sort of created in telling stories. Um, with this one, though, um, we left some of the conventions that have served him so well um, aside, and one of those would be narration. And uh, the reason we were able to do that was really because the five had such a great mastery of what had happened to them. And so we considered narration until we interviewed them and then thought we can build a film around these interviews. Uh, and we had hoped that we would hear from the prosecutors and the police who were involved as well, and that to collectively they would tell the story and we would get out of the way. Um, but the five had such a deep understanding that we could start with that and then fill in the spaces with other people who are familiar with the case. I've um, worked exclusively with public television for the last 30 years, and the audiences that we reach with these films are in the tens of millions, and we're looking forward to a PBS broadcast, we hope, uh, of that sort of nature. But the theatrical release has a whole other uh, component to it, as does the festival circuit, uh, insofar as it gets a different kind of attention. It gets a cinematic and not a television uh, attention, and that, I think, is extremely helpful, and it is, of course, our desire to have some kind of resolution, some sort of um, closure on this horrible case. For 13 years, this was a, a, a real tragedy of justice denied for the Central Park Five. Uh, now it's been nearly a decade of justice delayed, which we know is also justice denied. And it would be nice to just put a stop to it all. And, and it's healthy, not just for the Central Park Five, it's good for the people of the city of New York, it's good for the officials that are resisting all of this, because it allows us to finally heal a wound that has festered for way too long. In a case, you know, we just picked this cat scab off this wound over and over and over again, and it's, it's time to let it heal. It's time to let it heal. This is the ultimate siren that says none of us is safe.